Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday service. <clears throat> I am Naya Swami Jayanti, and this is Brahmacharini Chandrika, and it's our great pleasure and blessing to be serving you this morning, leading Sunday service. Today's topic is really quite a very important one, probably the most important one of the entire year, if one could pick one out. <clears throat> But since uh, Swamiji always pairs the affirmation with the reading in such a delightful way, and today's affirmation was on the subject of humor, I thought I would start first with a little bit of humor. <laughs> Swamiji used to love to tell the story on himself when one time he was giving a lecture in India, and he was looking out over the crowd, and um, he had a, a very strong feeling about you know people not turning their cell phones off and he was quite adamant about it. It was very disruptive. And so he was somewhere in the first few sentences of his talk, and all of a sudden a cell phone rang. And he stopped, and he said, could you kindly turn your cell phones off? And then he began to speak again, and it rang again. And he looked around like, didn't you get that? The third time when it rang, he just laughed out loud because it was his cell phone in his pocket. <laughs> so this affirmation reminds me so much of that story. And I had a very similar thing happen to me one time. And it was, I, I always loved that story and I used to laugh at it quite sincerely. Um, have you ever put your cell phone down someplace and you don't know where it is? Yeah. Anybody ever do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I did that. <clears throat> And I didn't know where it was. And I needed it because I was working and I needed to be able to make a call to somebody on my cell phone. And I went all over the house looking for it. I work from home most of the time. So I looked in my, my office. I couldn't find it anywhere. I just couldn't find it anywhere. So OK, OK, I'll call it. So I call, picked up the house phone and I called my cell phone. And I could hear it ringing, but it was kind of vague. You know, it's like, I can't really tell what room that's in. So I went from room to room again as it was ringing, and I still couldn't find it. So I thought, oh, gosh, I've got to call it again. So I called, where is it, where is it? And I walked into my office, and I think, it's got to be here. It's close. I can tell it's close. And then it hit me. It was in the back pocket of my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Divine Mother loves to have such fun with us. It's, it's a great way of keeping our egos in proper perspective, lest we get too full of ourselves. And that certainly worked that way. I had another incident of that um, this week. Uh, we had our grandchildren, they're three and almost five years old, with us a couple of weeks ago. And we had just such a wonderful time with them. But they brought something with them that we really would have rather they had left behind. But um, they had um, a cold. <laughs> and uh, you know how it is with little kids. They go to preschool and they catch everything that's going around. Mm -hmm. Well. And so uh, my husband, Hanuman, contracted it after they left, and he was pretty well knocked flat. And I thought, well, I can't afford to be sick, Divine Mother. You know I can't afford to be sick. I'm going to be giving Sunday service. So you'll have to take care of that problem. Well, of course, yesterday morning, I wake up, and you know, I'm coming down with the bug. <laughs> so I said, OK, I get it. <laughs> Don't think about the body. You know, Just really focus on first things first. So. <clears throat> Divine Mother loves to play with us that way. It keeps us, uh, everything in perspective. So seek ye, the first of kingdom, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When I was a child and I first heard this, it was one of my favorite scriptures, but I didn't really know the depth of what it meant. Um, it's like, okay, well, if I seek God first, then if I want to, uh, a good husband, if I want a beautiful house, if I want, you know, and all these things will be added? Is it really about that? Um, and it is, but it isn't because we seek God to get those things. When we put God first in everything, then God has a way of manipulating our lives in such a way that those things that we also would like to have or could benefit by may not be exactly what we think we want. Um, but those are attracted to us also by the sheer magnetism of the energy that we put out with our love for God. So in a way, it, it is that. We do get to get those other things. 
And the analogy that Swami Kriyananda used to use, it's kind of like a puppet. Have you ever seen those marionette puppets that you know, have strings and there's a thing that holds the strings up here at the top? Well, if you pick that piece of wood up by the knot where the, where the knot is tied on top of the wood, the puppet just kind of falls all into one you know, line in position. But if you pick it up by the leg or the hand or the head or something, then the strings are all over the place. Well, if we put God first, it's like picking that puppet up by the point at which everything else falls into place. Everything else in our life will fall into place when we seek God first. And it's just that simple. We tend to make it more complicated than it needs to be because it isn't complicated. Finding God is simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. It's keeping our energy here at the point between the eyebrows, our focus here, and our hearts open to the divine with great love, with great devotion. It's not a difficult thing. We tend to want to make it difficult. When the focus of our attention is on God, everything else just falls naturally into place, and contentment and harmony are ours. You know, that story from the reading about the two penniless boys in Brindaban from the autobiography of a yogi is such a delightful story, and it really shows how Ananta, um, Yogananda's older brother, was testing him because he didn't think that God was going to take care of the boys. So he sent them without any money at all, and they had to take this trip by train to Brindaban. They didn't have any money to buy food. They couldn't ask for food. They couldn't tell anybody what their plight was. They had to do it all on faith. And yet they accomplished it all. In fact, when they were fed, they were fed a feast that was an incredible feast. Um, Someone that they met on the train said, you know, why don't you come with us um, to visit this this house, this ashram, where the, the woman was preparing a sumptuous meal for a princess, and the princess couldn't attend. So, you know, would you come and join us and be our guest? And they sat down and they had a feast like you wouldn't imagine. I mean, it was just incredible. It wasn't just that they got fed. They got fed gloriously, you know, with a sumptuous repast. It was just incredible. You know, at another point in time in the autobiography of a yogi, Ananta also challenged Yogananda, and it was when he didn't want to uh, take his, the money from his father. He didn't want to go into the same work that his father did. He wanted to be a swami. He wanted to be a monk. He felt that God had called him in this life to be a monk. And Ananta says to him, money first, God can come later. Who knows? Life may be too long. And Mukunda, young Yogananda, without hesitating at all, said, God first. Money is his slave. Who can tell? Life may be too short. And it was such a beautiful comment, a beautiful remark. And the irony is that, in fact, Ananta's life was cut short. And, but at least he took initiation and became a Kriyaban before that happened. But we never know. We don't know what our calendar is going to look like next week or next month or next year. We don't know when God will call us and all of our appointments will be cleared off the calendar. And all those things that we thought were so very important that had all of our energy and our time tied up in them simply will disappear because they're not really that important. Which, thinking in that manner, for me anyway, helps me bring me back to the point of, okay, what's important? What did I come here for? I came here to find God. So what do I need to do to make that happen? Okay, I need to put God first. I need to meditate. Um, I need to develop devotion. I need to be serviceful. Um, But always with the thought that I'm doing everything that I do for God. Everything, without the thought of the results, without the desire, uh, you know, it says in the Gita, nishkam karma, action without the desire of the fruits for the action. You do it because it's the dharmic thing to do, and because in so doing, it's going to propel you forward on your spiritual journey and bring you to God much more quickly. Now, one of the ways that we can help develop that devotion, which is so important, you know, um, in the Ananda Online Library, there are some notes that Swamiji wrote when he was in charge of the monks um, after Master left his body. Um, he wrote down some notes for the monks to kind of give them guidelines of things to follow. And he mentioned quite a number of things <clears throat> that he said that they should be working on. 
devotion, will, discrimination, attunement with the guru, practicing the presence of God, following the rules and the fourfold vow of renunciation that they take as monks, regular meditation, willingness, enthusiasm for the work without personal ambition, overcoming moods, which means even-mindedness, always trying to overcome the lower qualities in one's nature and to embrace the higher ones. All very powerful things and guidelines that work just as well for any one of us in our path um, to God. But in developing devotion, which you notice he listed as number one, how do we develop devotion? Supposedly you're an intellectual type, you know, you might be the type that lives more in your left brain than your right, and you might think more in terms of mathematical science or, or, or whatever the situation may be. Some people are more, their temperament is more oriented that way. Women tend to be more devotional, it's just our nature. Um, but not all women are. Some women are also more left brain and think more in terms of intellectual uh, science than others. But devotion is important. It not only says so in Swami's notes to the uh, monks, but it also says so in the Gita. It's absolutely critical. Patanjali mentions it as one of the very important um, niyamas. And he doesn't say it's the most important one, but Master said it's the most important one. In fact, a monk one time said to Master, it's important for us to develop devotion, right? It's, it's the most important thing. And Master said, it's the only thing. So if we love God with enough intensity that all of our energy from, draws the energy up from the lower spine to the heart chakra and then shoots it up towards the spiritual eye, if we love God with that kind of intensity, then that will draw the energy that's needed to take us all the way to liberation. So devotion is critical. So how do we increase devotion? Well, what aspect of the divine do you relate to? Now, if you're real scientific and mathematical, you might think of God as the cosmic ground of being. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's true. God is that. But is it something that you can relate to that increases your feeling of love for God? And if not, then you might want to pick a more personal thing. Think of God as the Divine Mother. Uh, that's the way Master used to think of God. He referred to the Divine Mother, Divine Mother as Kali was his particular uh, way of thinking. But he saw God as the Divine Mother. And he himself said, God is closer. I mean, Mother is closer than the Father. The Father tends to be more going by wisdom. The Mother goes more by love of the heart. But whatever deity or aspect of God that, you, that draws you near and really touches your heart, dive deeply into that. Don't think, well, someday I'll find something that I relate to because I love God in all these different forms and all these different things. But if you're always keeping yourself light and you don't dive deep, then you never get to where you need to be. So it's important to try and take it to that level of depth. So you can think of God as the Divine Mother or the Divine Father, if that's your preference. But if you think of God as the Divine Mother, then think of yourself as that loving child and see yourself in that relationship. It should be a very personal relationship. Yogananda said, God is the nearest of the near and the dearest of the dear. We tend to hold him aloft and afar as something distant and far out there in the cosmos, but he's far out there in the cosmos, but he's just as much right here inside our hearts. So it's important that we relate on that very personal level because that's the sweetness and the power of the love that can really draw us to the heights that we're looking for. So we can think of God as the Divine Mother. If you think of God as the Divine Father, then see yourself as, as the loving child or um, daughter um, to the Divine Father and draw on that wisdom aspect, if that's the way you relate. If you see God as nature, then know that it's, you know, it's interesting. We call nature, mother nature. Isn't that interesting? And it's because it is the mother energy that has manifested the universe. Yogananda said that it's the own vibration that was sent out by God from the center of his consciousness as Om that manifested the entire 
um, universe and in nature as well, when we call nature, Mother Nature. So you can feel the sweetness. You can feel the sweetness as when the rain comes, like it did yesterday, and it was so wonderful to see the rain after so many weeks of drought and just feel like it's Divine Mother's mercy falling upon us all. It was just so sweet. Or you can see her in the birds and listen to her song. Whatever aspect of God you relate to, try to take that to a level of depth that your love for God just increases and increases beyond all bounds. In India, they refer to this concept of, of the bhav. The bhav meaning it, it's, um, it, it's an interesting word. There's no direct translation into English, but... It's how the devotee relates in that loving way to God, whatever your bhav is. Some people are more devotional naturally, some people are more intellectual, more by jnana, they go by wisdom, or they go by action, which is karma yoga. But ultimately, we all have to develop that, that in power of devotion, which has the magnetism to take us all the way to God. And Swamiji says that as you progress spiritually, your bhav will become more and more refined. So if you see God as the Divine Mother and you see her in a personal form in your mind and that's the way you relate to her, there will come a point in time when you see her everywhere, in every form, in every person, in every circumstance. Um, and so we can use that awareness of that bhav that loving, joyful um, openness to Divine Mother to help draw us. In the Gita reading today, those who worship lesser gods go to their gods, but those who worship me come to me. Now, Swami Kriyananda says in the essence of the Bhagavad Gita that that was actually intended to apply to the situation of those going to the astral world after death, that those that have chosen God first and have advanced to that point go directly to God. They don't have to go to the astral world. But he said but that you can apply it just as well on the level of people who choose materialism, people who make their material life and material satisfactions their God. That is the level of consciousness that they go to after death in the astral world. But for those who put God first and say, no, I want God. And, you know, it, we don't have to want God. I mean, we can take as long as we need to get, arrive at that point. Sooner or later, we have to arrive at that point that what we want is God. But, you know, after a while, for the devotee anyway, there comes that point, as Yogananda described it, the anguishing monotony of the mundane existence. The up and the down. Oh, I like this thing. Oh, I don't like that thing. Oh, I want this, but oh, I don't want that. Um, life is good, wonderful. Oh, not so good today. You know, it's this constant roller coaster. And if we're tired of the roller coaster, there comes that point in time when we say, no, Divine Mother, I'm, I'm your naughty baby now. I'm not going to take those toys anymore. Don't give them to me. I want you, and that's all that I want. Worship might be defined as to be absorbed in the contemplation of some great good, whether real or imaginary. But worship is not the mere performance of rituals. It is a matter of inner attitude. Rituals by themselves are meaningless without devotion. And the important thing is that we not worship whatever it is that we do. Just see it as something that needs doing. It's something that God has given us to do. Those who worship me come to me. To worship God means to approach him with an attitude of love and dedication and total self-offering, of total absorption in the contemplation of him in deep inner communion. Those whose lives thus revolve around their desire for God will surely come to him. Such is the Lord's promise. So that's our destiny, all of us. That's what we came for. That's what we live for. And whether we find him in this lifetime or the next or a hundred lifetimes from now, 
It doesn't really matter. That is the goal, the final goal. There is no other. And we can try to convince ourselves otherwise, but there really isn't any other goal. We won't have lasting peace. We won't have lasting joy until we arrive at that point where we have forsaken all other desires and there's nothing left in our heart but the desire for God. And then, as Swami Kriyananda said, at that point in time when you relinquish the last vestige of ego and are free from the ego, there's nothing left but divine love and bliss. God is ever new, ever conscious, ever existing bliss. That is our birthright. That is where we're headed. That is our goal. We have no other purpose in life but that. I wanted to share just a few words. I have spoken of this book before, and some of you are aware of it. Um, Sister Gyanamata was Yogananda's most advanced woman disciple, and she passed away four months before he did. Uh, and she was a great saint. And because we get caught up in our little troubles and we think so much of them, I wanted to share, actually, one of, of the way she communicated with the other disciples was mostly through letters. She, Master never asked her to teach. She never gave a Sunday service. Uh, she didn't perform ministerial duties <coughs> other than one-on-one -on -one counseling. And she did teach Sunday school for a period of time at Encinitas, but she didn't need to do those things. She didn't need that role in this lifetime. She was very close to the end, so she didn't need that. But I wanted to share something, a letter that she wrote to someone who was having great troubles. I want to finish my talk this way because it is not likely that I will have a chance alone with you. Besides, I do not want to discuss personalities, but to lay down some principles that I know will help you, for they are true, basic, and timeless. First, the meeting with the guru is not for pleasure. It is a hand-to-hand -hand conflict between his God-conscious soul and the newly awakening soul of the disciple. Second, a master does not care whether you suffer or not, whether your feelings are hurt or not, because he knows that when his work for your soul is accomplished, all suffering will be over for you. One night at dinner not long ago, our guru said, all suffering is from Satan. It was some time before I got the full meaning, meaning though it is obvious. A perfect soul is all bliss. You cannot hurt its feelings nor bring tears to its eyes. Third, your feelings were hurt? What of it? Resolve that for you will dawn the day of absolute liberation from all petty feelings. Four, do you remember my telling you that when I first came to the Mother Center, I determined that whatever happened, I would not be daunted nor ask explanations. I would try to see eye to eye with the Guru. The result has justified the experiment, and not long ago he praised me because he never had to explain anything to me. Fifth, make a few simple rules for yourself. If the guru seems to be displeased with you, ask him to show you wherein you were wrong, if you do not already know, that you may improve. If you wish to explain yourself, do so, for he always welcomes explanations, but do so respectfully, with sincerity, and with humility. Now what does that word humility mean? Nothing worm-like or groveling. It means the simple, straightforward forward admission that you are not perfect and that you know you get nothing in the way of blame or discipline that you do not deserve. Never stay away from him as you have done. If you get only suffering, suffering come just the same. Remember how the saint kept coming when his guru to test him would not speak to him? Dear one, the above is just the experience you are having. Please do not throw this letter away, even if you do not like or understand it. Keep it until you do. And then I just wanted to share 
the last 20 years of Gyanamata's life, she suffered tremendously on the physical plane. She had all manner of illnesses. She had pernicious anemia, which made it very difficult for her to breathe. She didn't get enough oxygen uh, because her blood cells weren't functioning appropriately. And she had other troubles, but she, she endured it all. And Master actually kept her in the body for her to finish that karma. But even more than that, he said after she was gone that she was working out the karma of other disciples in her own body. And she was truly a great saint. There came a point in time towards the end when she was struggling and it was difficult for her to even walk across the room. But always Yogananda would encourage her to get some exercise. So in obedience to him, she would get up and with someone's help, she would make the, he, the valiant effort to walk across the room with some assistance. And one of the nuns who was assisting her during this time in her life said, Sister had very strong willpower. It seemed to me that her body was just falling apart. And once, when I honestly did not see how she could make her body walk, I asked her, Sister, how do you do it? She looked at me with a twinkle in those marvelous blue eyes and said, I just say to God, you pick them up, Lord, and I'll put them down. <laughs> and after she passed, <clears throat> um, Master said about her after she left the body, Master was not with her when he left the body. Divine Mother always spared him that. He was never with the devotees when they passed. She always spared him that. And so he had taken a drive in the car. And when he came back and the nun said that sister has passed, he went in and he sat quietly at her bedside and just meditated and offering her blessings. And those nuns and monks standing outside the room heard him say, Sister, you went before me. And he was gone four months later. But then he asked everyone to come into the room and he said, now I want you to feel the top of her head. This is remarkable, for it was very hot, as if on fire. Now I want you to feel her feet. They were ice cold. Master explains, this shows that she has left the body in the highest state of samadhi. Her soul departed through the highest spinal center, the thousand-petaled lotus in the brain. She has now achieved the final state of mukti, or liberation. She is free. She has no need to return to this world, but we will meet again. Let us all hold to that thought. No matter what God sends us, we can endure. We can keep God first. We can get to the end just as Sister did. In another letter that she wrote to someone, and I wanted to leave you with these words, she wrote four points for them to remember. See nothing, look at nothing but your goal ever shining before you. The things that happen to us do not matter. What we become through them does. Each day accept everything as coming to you from God. And at night, give everything back into his hands. May we all be free. Mm.